What's going on, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of JAR. JAR, for those of you that may be new, stands for Joe. And Amy. Review. And this is our weekly show where we review the magic stories. Just as a little heads up at the beginning of this, we are obviously filming this prior to the, um, the class tour or the campus tour for Strixhaven, where in the past they have announced things about magic stories. So we don't know a thing about it, but if the magic story does in fact start this week or this Friday, then next week will not be the continuation of this portion of JAR, but we will start on the Strixhaven stories. We don't know anything about it yet. Stay tuned maybe to our socials or just make sure that you're subscribed and have the bell rung so you will know exactly when our Strixhaven story reviews come out. Uh, also, if you're interested in magic... Or more of these reviews if that's what happens to be coming up next. Absolutely correct. Yes, that if there is no announcement of that, we will definitely just still be back with this. Thank you. Um, if you are interested in Magic Legends, we talked about it this past week, this Monday, and this will be a temporary thing, not a permanent thing, right. but this Monday, we will be streaming, as we normally do, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time, right here on this channel, we will be streaming Magic Legends instead of MTG Arena. Again, yes. temporary, not permanent change, but people were interested in seeing it, and so we will be presenting it to all of you in that way. We would love it if you would come and join us for that as well. We stream on Fridays, too. Subscribing and ringing that bell, you'll find out when we go live, too. Just saying. Please do. But that is not what we're here for today. As I said, we are here for JAR. We are here to continue our review of the Battle for Zendikar slash Oath of the Gatewatch stories. We are here with story number 17, Shaping an Army by Ken Troop. My quick review up at the top of this one is, genuinely, this is one of my favorite magic stories of all time. Wow. And I think that, I mean, understanding the concept of the battle for Zendikar and the fact that they're fighting the Eldrazi, besides that, I think that this is a pretty good on-its-own story as well. That if you've read none of the ones surrounding it, you wouldn't be missing out on too much um, to, to read this one. Mm -hmm. So I would recommend it, personally. And that's just me. What are, what are your thoughts? I think that's a good point. Um, yeah, I would say that... Um... It's standalone enough, sure, um, and it's good, uh, but uh, these stories are older, and so the surrounding stories are just as good, I think. Agreed. I mean, this is one of your favorite <clears throat> stories, but for me, this is not one of my favorite stories, but it's still good, and I think the ones surrounding it are as good, so... Yeah. It could be standalone if you prefer to just read this one, but I think uh, I would recommend that you read them all because I think they're all really good. Sure. Um, but it uh, it is separate enough where, and also like, um, explains enough of things where you wouldn't necessarily need to have read uh, the other stories before it to understand it. Correct. Yeah, and I think, I mean, you'll see when we get into the full review itself, but we, we, we why this is my favorite story of all time. And it is, I'll, I'll admit, it is very specific to me why that's the case, but still. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah, we give our quick review in the beginning because what we try to do with this series, even though we're reviewing older ones, is we try to review, not summarize. So we encourage you, if you would like to go read this story, the top link in the description down below will take you to this story. If you have some time, I, again, we encourage that you read it because it's good um, and it's definitely worth your time, in our opinion. And then, of course, when you're done, we would love it if you'd come back and continue the discussion with us and your fellow viewers in the comments down below. All right. But onto the full review itself... This story is uh, told solely from the perspective of Noyan Dar. There are no other named characters in this story, to my knowledge, except for Gideon, and then stories told about Cozy and Ula, but they're not present, so to speak, in the story. So, um, did you want to start off talking about this one, or me? Uh, you can start off. I don't know what you're going to be saying about it. Sure. Cause... All I know is that it's going to be really different from what I have to say. <laughs> yes, so. and in in the best way because yeah. I think I think it's very interesting. This is one of the 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 episodes that I really enjoy uh, being able to make with you because I focused on. I guess we'll start with the reason why this is my one of my favorite stories. Noyandar speaks to me on such a deep <laughs> level. 
Noyandar is sarcastic, he is dry, he is witty, he is hilarious. And for that, that's why it's 100% my aesthetic. That's just, I love that type of humor. I am that way sometimes where it's just like, oh yeah, this is definitely what I want to be doing right now. Right? That's, that is me to a T. And so... A filming jar. <laughs> and so I love Noyan Dar shit again. so much because it, it's a tertiary character, right? It's a, it's a, a card in the set. But, um, I know, I think we have a foil one uh, yeah, that we yeah. opened in one of my favorite opening videos that we've ever done. <laughs> so I encourage you to go check that out. But, um, but yeah, the... Uh, oh, I was the one that loved Merfolk. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, that was, like, the least crazy thing that we opened in that, was a foil rare Noyandar Royal Shaper. It's just that yeah. it's part of my one of my favorite opening videos that we've ever done. Yeah. So, um, but... Noyandar is a great character. I'm, I'm, and this story did him. Check out that opening. It, it's really old. <laughs> maybe it's in the I card at the top corner. Maybe that makes more work for me. But there you go. Maybe I did it. Maybe I didn't. Um, but uh, Noyandar being super sarcastic and funny and witty. This whole story is that. Is his wit? Is his is his comedic timing and etc. And yet, when we read this story, the reason why I really appreciate it is because the first thing that you mentioned was what? What? This. Well, so I mentioned that because you said it to me prior. I did? Yeah. So the last story that we read, when we talked, we didn't say it in the video, I don't think. Oh, okay. But when we talked about it, you were like, oh, the royals just like climate change. <laughs> and I was like, oh, of course it is. Like, that makes perfect sense. So now I've formulated this like whole analysis of this and how it relates to climate change and how it relates to like people who deny climate change and all kinds of things. So we can kind of get to that later if you want to like talk about the things that you really like about the story or the, the stuff that you wanted to cover that's not as involved. <laughs> well, no, I, I think that's fine. I think to, as a slight bit of context, I guess, for people who may not have chosen to read the story, Noyandar is a royal shaper, and he is in charge of all of the royal shapers who shape the royal. They used to be lull mages, which means they would work to quiet the royal. So if the royal came up, they would use their magic to quell it and bring it back down. But now that the Eldrazi are here, they're like, hey, you know, if we can quell it, maybe we can use it to our advantage to kill these things. Um, and we see kind of a really awesome display of that towards the end. But um, but that's the, the dichotomy that Noy and Dar lives by is, you know, working as a lull mage previously, and now as this destructive force of a royal shaper to use the might of the royal. So, the, again, I don't know that there's a ton to say, because uh, you, I think you mentioned this appropriately when we were talking about it before we started filming. You can't... I, I would not have been able to write down funny parts of this story because there are way too many of them. Yeah. Truly way too many of them. Yeah, because I was like, oh, you love this story. Yes, it's really funny. I know. Like, write down a lot of those bits and pieces so that you can talk about them and, and, and highlight how great they are. And he was having a hard time doing yeah. that. It's like, what, what parts would I choose? There's so many of them. Yeah. So that's that's really all i can say about it if you haven't read it read it it's so funny yeah. it was so well done in that regard so but i i i appreciated the dichotomy of me sitting there being like this one's funny this dude's sarcastic i love it and you're sitting there being like he's also a climate change denier and i'm like what <laughs> so yes you're please go right ahead i well, i, I want to and and uh the <laughs> the um The fact that this story is, like, I remember 
when we read this story previously and mm -hmm. like how I remember liking it. Like yeah. I, before you really started, I was like, oh yeah, this is that really funny one. But I'm kind of glad that I let that preconception kind of fall away pretty quickly as you were reading it because that's what allowed me to like formulate all these um, bits of analysis. Yeah. Um, Which are very impressive if I might add. I, uh, I like it a lot. I thought you did a really good job. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if the royal represents climate change, um, I, I just had you write down like um, a lot of like specific lines that were said that kind of um, lead me to believe that the sort of people who would be um, climate change deniers would actually say. So, um, it, now, I haven't explained how that even makes sense. You're like, oh, they're like specifically doing stuff to the royals, so why would you say that they're climate change deniers if the royal is climate change? Like, they're the ones who are very aware of it and doing things to it and whatnot. So what I, my analysis of that is, the story is kind of saying, like, Noyandar is um, calling them initiates, which reminded me of the Amonkhet stories, which... <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know which direction, it's, but they, those stories are yet to come. Yes. So when I was thinking about it, I was like, oh, they're like calling out I'm in Ket right now and I can make so many parallels there. And he's like, they didn't write I'm in Ket yet. And I was like, <laughs> oh, that's even better because it's just like the fact that the initiates in I'm in Ket were called initiates. Um, is so appropriate with the analysis that I am applying to this story with who these initiates are, mm -hmm. which is they're being um, they're being taught, or I, I won't say brainwashed because that's a little bit much, but they're being taught that. Um, emotions and um, th that calm and balance are death. Mm -hmm. So the actual quote is them saying that calm and balance are death. Yeah, it's like it's like they're it, it's what they like chant when they're like moving to work the royal is you know calm is death, balance is death, and like all this like really negative stuff. Yeah. So and so like. I'm applying the same um, analysis to this as I'm applying to all the stories prior to this and all the stories after this, which is that a lot of them, not all of them, um, are really kind of based on this sort of theory of, um, or this sort of through line, I guess I would say, of like um, being traumatized and then coming back from it. Mm -hmm. because that through line extended all the way to the most recent story that was written. Sure. Um, and not all the stories were about that, obviously, um, but there were a very large number of them that had that as a theme or as um, something that they uh, gave a nod to, even though that's not really what the story was about. Um, so... The royal being climate change, also the royal is, like, emotions. Mm -hmm. So, um, they were trying to, like, push them down, um, trying to, like, quell them, not let, you know, not let it release, not let it do what it had to do, and then, um, they got to a point where they had to start figuring out how they could use it to benefit them instead because pushing it down, pushing it down, pushing it down, not letting it do its thing caused it to now become this essentially like terrible, uncontrollable 
mess of a thing that just destroys everything in its wake. Mm -hmm. um, so I was trying to say that the royal shapers in this case are climate change deniers in that they are, um, they're, uh, they're denying calm, they're denying balance. So the types of things that um, uh, we learn to have as people who have been taught our whole lives to not feel emotions, to push them down, things like that, um, we have to learn calm, we have to learn balance. We have to gain awareness. And, you know, one of the other lines was them specifically saying, Noyandar has no awareness of the world around him at this point. While he's, like, in right. that motion or whatever. So, uh, like, the the way to heal from that is is to fall into that calm, fall into that balance fall into an acceptance of what is as opposed to trying so hard like these royal shapers are to make it do what you want it to do. Um, just having acceptance for what it is, how it is, and letting it be what it is and how it is. And I've referenced in other jars um, how silly I thought it was that um, despite the royal being a problem, I found it silly that people were trying to do anything about it. Right. Um, because how you fix that problem is by fixing the cause, not by fixing the symptom. Mm -hmm. So my point is they're doing it wrong. <laughs> Um, like, they're climate change deniers in that they're spending so much time, like, knowing it, like, knowing that climate change exists, but being in denial about it, and, um, like, all this, like, forcing that they're doing one way or another, um, is, is them, like, trying way too hard to, to, um keep that level of denial and that's so on par with what it means to be a traumatized person so you live your whole life being told or or learning i should say because it's not necessarily a verbal thing um that um that your emotions need to be pushed down and are uh, unimportant or they're um, a problem. The royal's a problem, right? <laughs> um, and instead of fixing the cause, which is um, being able to find that awareness and that calm and that balance, you're trying to fix the symptom by overly controlling the royal yeah um as opposed to just accepting the royal for what it is and not negatively judging it and just allowing it to be what it needs to be and do what it needs to do and um you know allowing yourself to be um kind of in harmony with it mm -hmm. as opposed to like fighting against it or trying to control it. Right. Um, so um, I just wanted to write that like, um, or I just wanted to say, so I tried to like have him write certain <laughs> things down for <laughs> me. Um, so I'm just going to try so and like bear with you know. her as she attempts to uh, decipher my handwriting, <laughs> which, you know, it's funny. I always thought I'm, I'm vamping a bit, but it's, it's something that I wanted to say. I always thought that I had like semi decent handwriting and then, uh, you know, find somebody that keeps you humble. Uh, I, <laughs> well, it's fine. I mean, 
you're a lefty, so like it's hard to have good handwriting when you're a lefty sometimes because there's a lot of smudging. Or Thankfully, not so much here. But you're pretty good about the smudging. So. Yeah, I like you know I like miss I missed a word here, so I like wrote over it in there. But this, but, you know. Yeah, whatever. Stuff like that, I would even have writing, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, basically, like what I'm trying to say is, they're like, they're not like brainwashed or like mind controlled necessarily, but they're like chanting and like learning and the things that you give time and repetition to are the things that stick with you mm -hmm. and That's the fair. things that your brain learns to be the truth right so when we talk about what it means to be um a traumatized person um, cause obviously like how it relates to Zendikar is Zendikar is a traumatized plane, you know, um, hence why the Royal even exists in the exactly. first place. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but when you talk about what it means to be a traumatized person, um, your, <laughs> um, If, if you need to read over it, I can... Yeah, I think I might just... I, I have one thing that I want to talk about that has nothing to do with anything at all, but I don't know where else I would put it. I just wanted to point out, there was a quote in here that said... You can keep reading. Okay. But there was, a, there was a quote in here that said, What sane, intelligent person has blades coming out of one's hand? <laughs> I thought that was great, and I thought it was uh, very interesting that um, even back then... When, um, well, I mean, I guess they were still doing their thing, but that, uh, I guess no pun intended, but that, that wizards would be taking a stab or a jab at, um, at Marvel, at X-Men, at, you know, the Fox movie, at that time, the Fox movie franchise X-Men, but now back to Marvel again because, uh, Disney purchased Fox and all that fun stuff. Capitalism. But, uh, <laughs> but that, that, you know, what, what person, sane, intelligent person would have blades come out of their hand. Well, I would argue the most famous character that has blades coming out of one's hand would be Wolverine, and so I just thought that was an interesting thing. Because if you're unaware, that was Noyan Dar talking about Gideon Searl, which came out of the back of his hand, and Noyan Dar had some things to say about it. And again, I think that is like the most tame of the funny, sarcastic lines that Noyan Dar has. So again, if you haven't read it yet, that that is the type of um, dialogue that you will get from Noyan Dar, especially as it relates to Gideon, and it is some good stuff. So I'll just kind of read off these bullet points. I think it it'll just be easier than trying to like actually formulate what I'm trying to say here. No judgments here. And then you know if. If I need to expand on them, I can. And if anybody has any questions on anything, yeah, don't uh, that the comment section for these videos is supposed to be full of you all joining in with us. We'll we'll get to that at the end. But but talking talking to us about your opinions, contrasted and compared with ours. Yeah. That's all. So go ahead. Amy. So um, bullet point one just says deniers are the ones working the hardest to say that it's not real. Right, the royal shapers are doing the same thing, um, so those people have to work really hard to control the royal um, uh, to remain in denial that it exists. Essentially, that's the that's a direct parallel to um, trauma, like what happens during trauma. It. it Sounds like it doesn't make sense, but it does. So when you're in denial about something, you know it, right? But you keep yourself, um, whether it's deliberate or not, from knowing it, right? So um, they were trying so hard, trying so hard, trying so hard. Um,
because that's what allowed them to keep going on that same trajectory instead of um, gaining that acceptance, that calm, that balance yeah. that they're refusing, right? And that's what you do when you're in denial is you refuse those things. Um, you refuse the acceptance of the truth. Um, uh, accepting it would be um, leaving it alone and uh, focusing. And, and, and Sorry. Focusing or facing. No, focusing. Uh, on the problem, um, which they won't do because then they'd have to admit, you know. So that's. That's just like, uh, uh, I'm just explaining denial a little bit more there. Uh, things that are for the greater good. Okay, so they had a line where they said something about um, the greater good. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, um, they were saying that what they were doing was the greater good. I right. Think. Um, oh, they, but, they specifically said that things that are for the greater good are enjoyed by no one. I think that was the line. Well, yes, but I was trying to say that... Sorry. Um, I think they were trying to say that what they were doing was for the greater good. Correct. I would, in contrast, say that um, what they were doing was the opposite of <laughs> <laughs> uh, what the greater good actually needs. Um, but... Either way, um, that part's kind of irrelevant because it's going back to the symbolism now. So, or the analogy or whatever mm -hmm. um, of basically um, the line, like you said, the line is things that are for the greater good are enjoyed by no one. And so my response to that is to say, like, if things... Like, what is actually for the greater good doesn't, is not, um, so this one's less about the trauma and more about climate change. <laughs> um, <laughs> stuff that's actually for the greater good, um, is enjoyed by no one. Meaning, um, suck it up. <laughs> yeah. You have a responsibility. Yeah. To apply that understanding, apply that acceptance to understand that trying to control things or dealing with the symptoms is not the way to do it. You have to go back to the source. You have to fix the cause. Otherwise, nothing is actually being improved. Mm -hmm. Um... Did I leave off? Uh, you were done here. So this <laughs> line, which is also awesome. not used to doing this. Um, so uh, this one says, "So much grass had uh, suffered for the sake. sake of conquering inner peace." Which I think is hilarious because that's a, that is a quote from the story, which. Amy I mean, was talking about perfectly fits <laughs> like a puzzle piece into my analysis. Yeah, so funny. Um, Super funny. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's the perfect line to represent climate change. So much grass had suffered for the sake of conquering inner peace. <laughs> Meaning, all these people who choose to deny or um, decide that the money's more important. Right. And, like, actively campaign against efforts to fix right. it or whatever. Or sit there and say... I don't want awareness. I don't want calm. I don't want balance. I don't want acceptance. I don't want to understand what's happening and fix the cause. I only want to try and um, uh, micromanage the effects of it so yeah. that I can either say that it's not real or um, get something out of it. You know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, the initiates is next. I talked about that. Mm -hmm. um, that was my line, but then you had this line for... The raw pain that never heals. 
that's definitely the trauma as well as climate change. And that was something that I appreciated in the story, kind of even outside of the analogies, right, is that that was... These initiates were chanting this, you know, calm is death, balance is death, and that's how they were, like, moving the royal and trying to call for right. it. Noyan Dar stepped in at one point and added his magic to theirs during that, I was saying, there was that big display of their abilities at the end, which was amazing. And that was Noyan Dar stepping in for the first time in the story and actually showing us what he can do. And he had his own set of ideals or his own mantra of like, you know, it, it was very much um, like a, a, a superhero monologue, but the opposite, the exact opposite, right? It's not, uh, I am, uh, I'll, <laughs> the only example I can think of right now, and you're all welcome, I guess, but I am the terror that flies in the night Right? <laughs> I, and, and like talking about like all these things of like what you are and what your ideals are and etc. Faster than a speeding bullet can uh, leap tall buildings in a single bound, whatever it is. Noyan Dar's sitting here and he's saying like it's... He's more like a dark winged duck or like a... <laughs> That's exactly right. But it, he's saying like, you know, it's the mosquito in your ear at night. Right. right? It's the itch in the middle of your back that you can't reach. It's the raw pain that never heals. And a, some of them are comedic. Right? But also, they all make sense. It's that annoying thing that you cannot fix. You can't stop it. You can't make it better. And... Unless you embrace the ideals that they have chosen... Yeah. ...to deny. Yeah. Just saying. <laughs> and then I, I think that was it for your stuff, because then it, it goes down to here, but that's initiate stuff. Um, and then there's this story, and then this was the last point I wanted to make, so. Was this me, though? No, that's me. Oh, I mean, okay. again, it could be other of us. But... Okay, so go ahead. Yeah, so the end was kind of interesting, too. Noyandar works with... Gideon shows up, basically, if, if, if this was unclear. Gideon shows up and asks Noyandar and his initiates for help in fighting the Eldrazi at Seagate. And Noyandar doesn't want to do that. Why would he want to do that? This is where he is. He's working with these people. If the Eldrazi show up, they deal with them. It's not that big of a deal. And they're just here doing their thing, being royal mages. And at one point, as we have seen with a lot of the merfolk stories, or merfolk-centric stories in this set of stories, right? Whether it's um, the Kiora stories, or uh, Jorien, or whoever, the merfolk in these stories tend to talk about the gods, or their former gods, Kozi, Ula, Amiria. And Kozi and Ula are the main focus because, spoilers, they're the main focus of these sets, because they're the only two that are going to show up. Amiria shows up later somewhere else. Who could ever imagine where? Um, but, I love her so much. <laughs> I know you do, and I'm glad you do. Um, but Noyandar tells another Kozi and Ula story to Gideon talks about a pearl, or getting a pearl. And Gideon brings that back up at the end to Noyandar and says, hey, by the way, at the end, who gets the pearl? And Noyandar says, well, Cozy, of course. Cozy always, it, it, that's always how these stories go. Cozy tricks Ula into doing something that Ula doesn't want to do right. for Cozy's benefit. That's just how these stories go. And Gideon's like, huh, that's pretty interesting. That's really way too clever for me, but good on Cozy. And Noyandar's like, huh, yeah, well, we know. Gideon's an idiot. Blah, blah, blah. And then later on... And he, like, rides off into the sunset. Yeah, Gideon leaves. <laughs> Noyan's like... Big ol' smile. Yeah, Noyan's like, we'll be there in a week. Can't imagine why he's smiling so much, though. <laughs> and then later on in the night, he's like, God damn it. <laughs> because that's exactly what happened. Gideon showed up, tricked Noyandar into doing something that Noyan didn't want to do. It'll benefit Gideon. But... That's not the end. And I... That is brilliant, right? That's the actual end of the story, right? Is, is Noyan, like, coming to that realization that, oh my god, this idiot tricked me. He's not such an idiot. He is actually a genius. This whole time he was here, I was treating him like a moron, but he's actually really smart. Amazing. Super well done. A great through line for the story. But that's not the end of it. Because that whole sequence just is foreshadowing. It foreshadows 
the end of the Battle for Zendikar and the beginning of the Oath of the Gatewatch stories. I'll be kind of nice and not fully go into it, but I thought it was great. The, the whole aspect of if you haven't read these stories and you're following along with us, just realize Ulamog is here, Kozilek is not. We're hearing all these Ula Kozi stories, and if you're aware of um, the broad aspects of Magic Story, you know that the next block is Innistrad Eldritch Moon, or, uh, um, oh god, what's the name of the, what's the name of the Innistrad set? Why can't I think of it? I can't think of it. But the, whatever the Return to Innistrad set is, followed by Eldritch Moon, um, and you can let me know in the comments, but I'll, I'll have figured it out by then. But regardless, it's up to you. Uh, but, but those... the plane of Innistrad. Shadows over Innistrad. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Shadows over Innistrad and Eldritch Moon are where uh, Emrakul actually shows up. So Emrakul is not here. That's why we don't hear a lot about Emeria. But we've heard a lot about Cozy. Like, a lot about yeah. Cozy. And yet, we have uh, Cozy being the god character, but we've heard nothing about Kozilek who it is actually based on. We've heard a lot about Ula and Ula Mag, but nothing about Kozilek. And so, like I said, I, I won't go any further than that, but realize that this is very much mirrored in the later versions of these stories, uh, as these stories end and, and Oath of the Gatewatch stories begin. And the last thing I wanted to say is talking about, again, how much I love this story, how much I love the character of Noyan Dar. This is the type of story that spoiled story fans, that spoiled Vorthos. Okay. Because we ex this was a random story. Oh, not spoiled like spoilers. Spoiled like... Um, we became spoiled brats. Right. <laughs> that kind of thing. Yes, thank you for, for the clarification. Um, yeah, like we... Like, Oh, okay. We I became didn't think the foreshadowing was <laughs> that involved. No, all right. we we became expectant of a certain thing. Yeah, and this was this style. Right. Noyandar again, a random, rare, in the set, legendary creature, and yet this is the story that he gets. A full story. A big deal. He's like a fully fleshed out character now. Right. You understand him. You understand his past. You understand his personality. And you want it. Yeah. You understand it and you still love him. Yeah. You I want to I want to see him again. Uh, even today, I want to see him again. He wasn't in Zendikar Rising. And I don't think when Zendikar Rising came out that I was like, thank God we're going to get Noyan Dar again. <laughs> but at the same time, like reading back on this story, I'm like, yeah, where's Noyan Dar again? Now, to be fair, I don't know that I would want Noyan Dar written by an untested uh, author, but that's, I, I also don't know that, so I don't want to like... With like a bunch of restrictions placed upon them, well, and what I'm, have you. Right, and I'm, I'm not looking to throw shade necessarily, but what I'm saying is this was so good, and I've seen a lot of characters get the the raw end of the deal, or the, the, the short end of the stick kind of a thing, so who knows, but this, this was the thing that made it, that made Nikki Drayden's stories for Ravnica Allegiance and Guilds of Ravnica, such a breath of fresh air. Because they were so well done stories for tertiary characters, mm -hmm. right, or even just random one-off characters, mm -hmm. that it brought you back, whether you realized it or not, it brought you back to right. stories like this. Because yeah, you had like a nostalgia that, like you said, whether you realized it or yeah. not. Yeah, it that it's... It brought you back to these stories yeah. where those those types of things weren't weird. They just were how right. it was. And it was just, you, you'd show up one week and this kind of a story would be there and you'd be like, holy crap. You'd walk out of it and you'd be like, that's amazing. And all it is, again, it's shaping an army, gathering an army of people. This story didn't, it, it very well could have been... You know, Gideon showing up at a meeting in the next in the next uh, story and saying, "Hey, by the way, I found a group of royal mages. They control the royal. the The leader guy is a little rough around the edges, but they're very effective." Theoretically, that could have been this whole story, but then we wouldn't have, or or could have replaced this whole story, but then we wouldn't have gotten 
this. We wouldn't have gotten the symbolism and the discussions that came out of it, the character development for this, for, um, for Noy and Dar as this random legendary creature. It was amazing. It was super well done. But again, I'll say, this is story number 17. We don't get, we don't get, uh, we barely get a third of these yeah. nowadays. So you're not going to be able to have these stories with what's currently being written here in 2021 because they do, although I, I guess... information to pack in. It is and isn't. That is and is not fair to say. Because they have six main stories, six side stories, but the side stories are expected of these types of things. And that's fine. That's why, again... Because people cried out for it so much, that's why you got stories like right. side stories at all, is so that legendary creatures can be that much more important, can be that much more present, and you can give... What Wizards has been doing is, is being able to give authors that they aren't necessarily as... Maybe they aren't necessarily... Either the authors aren't as comfortable, or Wizards isn't as comfortable with them doing a full arc, but they can do one or two stories here and there. And to be fair, those are some of the best stories that we've seen, yeah. are these side stories. They're just so well done. I agree. So, if that's the case, you know, this is one of those stories that I, I think started that. Yeah. And so, if you still haven't read this one, I, I don't know what else to tell you. Top link in the description, we've removed all barriers... Just go read it. It's so yeah. fun. And if you want to go in depth with your analysis of it, do it. If you want to just sit there and be like, this is right. funny. Enjoy do that the too. laughter. Yeah. Go ahead. Do that too. However, because of course, however you want to read is how you want to read. And we're not going to tell you one way or another. But th that is for you. That is our tip. But I, I don't know. I love but this yeah, story so I mean, much. I definitely love your point that this is kind of where it began. To me, it's been more gradual. You sure. know, a lot of those Nissa stories for me, obviously. Sure. Um, you know, but um, the Drana story. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It it really started to ramp up. Doing these reviews has been really cool because we got to to see the beginnings, the you know of the ramping up of how amazing this story team became. Mm-hmm. And uh, and it seems like with this story, they're they're getting to that peak. Yeah. They're getting to that top. And then once they get there, they just keep going. They just stay there. They don't go back down. They're just on that same level until they're gone. Yeah. Until they're fired. Yeah. Um, yeah. Apologies for the beeping outside, but it's a nice spring day, so we had the window open, but we're also done. This is the yes. end of this particular episode. So <laughs> I, I would love, love, love people's thoughts down in the comments below. Yes. Do you love Noy and Dar? Are, are we, are we <laughs> simpatico on that? Um, what do you think of Noy and Dar? What do you think, of, more importantly, what do you think of Amy's analysis of this story, of yes. the, the points that are being brought up, and, you know, do you... And how it relates to the the older stories and the newer stories. So how it relates to the stories about Zendikar and, and Nyssa and um, her like lack of connection with the land yeah. and how it relates to the new stories about Nyssa and Nahiri yeah. and Jace, you know, all of that stuff, you know, Jace on Ixalan as well as on Zendikar and Ravnica. Um, yeah, because as we yeah, learned... Leave in the comments... Any and all things you have to think or say about any of that. <laughs> and, I want to know. And when you give us that full information dump <laughs> into the comments section, which I would love all to see. All of yeah, today. Just that, that word vomit. Um, <laughs> that is a great way for all of you to join us in showing off your... Hashtag Morthos Pride. It's really cool. As we learned last week, these stories are really good at connecting a lot of threads from yet to come stories at that time and even up to present day whether we're returning to a plane or it's a new plane entirely whatever it happens to be um the, this story team knew what they were doing yeah. and didn't write a story for that set they wrote a story for every set to come as right. well and for the the whole arc that they were going for yeah. so 
I just, I loved that they used the specific word of initiates. Yeah. Because when, when you read Am and Ket, it's, I mean, yeah. like, it's so perfectly representative of, like, these people have been taught how to live their lives wrong, essentially, <laughs> and now, like... The opposite way, right? Right, and now they have to learn the hard way how to fix it. Yeah. So, whatever story is being reviewed next week, we will be back next week, whether it's Strixhaven, well, eventually it's going to be Strixhaven, spoilers, but uh, whether it's next week or uh, some later time, we'll be back next week for another episode of JAR. We would love it if you would join us. As I said, please don't forget, subscribing and ringing the bell helps you out a lot, and then uh, doing things like liking and sharing helps us out a lot. So, uh, if you are willing to do that, we really would appreciate it, but... As I said, that is going to be the end. So, we would love to see you on stream Fridays, 8 to 10 p.m. for video game yes. stuff. And Mondays, 8 to 10 p.m., <laughs> usually for MTG Arena. But at least this week, maybe the week after, it depends on how it goes, for Magic Legends. And we would love to see you for that as well. So, Brand new game. Yeah, exactly. So, for now, from us here at the Geek for All family of channels, I have been Joe. And I'm Amy. And as we always say, in whichever video of ours you watch next, we will see you all next time. Thanks, everybody.